Thank you very much. Um, yeah, I'm not going to be talking CSS. This, uh, I'm going to talk React today. Um, no, it's OK. Um, so hello. Um, I, I'm sorry, Ikbenein Binliner? I, I, I find this funny. I guess you guys are probably used to it by now. Um, I, uh, I watched this video uh, a while back from a musician comedian called Tim Minchin. How many of you are familiar with Tim Minchin? Uh, if you haven't seen his videos, um, I highly recommend hopping on YouTube. Uh, maybe wait until after my talk, but um, definitely check them out. Uh, but a, a few years ago, he actually got um, an honorary PhD from uh, the university that he went to in Australia, uh, and he did his uh, acceptance speech, of which he had his nine uh, life lessons. And uh, before he got into these lessons, he was mentioning how he had gotten hired to be an inspirational speaker um, at this accounting software company. And uh, the other person that was there with him was uh, this mountain climber who unfortunately um, had gotten stuck on a mountain and uh, lost his legs. And um, I thought, man, climbing a mountain. I've climbed a mountain. Um, so I'm, maybe I can like, you know, kind of talk about these things. And I, 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 about a month and a half ago, climbed Mount Kilimanjaro. Um, which, if you look at my girth, might seem surprising. Um, I was out of breath climbing the stairs. Um, but uh, no, I've got, uh, I've got photographic proof that I climbed a mountain. Thank you. Yep, there's me on top of that mountain. Uh, no, that's actually, uh, that's actually me. Um, I did actually climb a mountain. Uh, as you can see, 5,895 meters. Good old 19,000 feet. Um, every one of them painful. Um, and it, it was uh, an interesting process. For those of you who haven't looked at that, I, a lot of people say, like, you know, anybody can climb Mount Kilimanjaro. It's relatively easy. Uh, but, uh, you know, and I didn't actually do any research before I decided to do this, which probably would have been a smart idea. Uh, in fact, uh, the, the route that I went, um, nicknamed the Coca-Cola route, uh, which is apt because I drink a lot of Coke, um, is uh, the easier route. But its success rate is actually only about 60%. And the reason for that is because a lot of people are actually unprepared for how difficult um, of a climb it is. Um, it takes about four days to climb up uh, and about uh, two days to climb down. And, uh, you know, again, most people would probably prepare ahead of time. You know, they would train, they do some, like, maybe climb some smaller mountains, maybe some hills. Uh, where I live, it's actually very flat. So um, there wasn't a lot of training. Um, I definitely was uh, heavily ill prepared for uh, this climb. Uh, but, you know, when I got there, I'm like, screw it, like, I'm not going to back out now, I might as well try. Uh, so, you know, despite, you know, most people are like, if I don't make it to the peak, um, I'm a failure. I just kind of thought, you know, I'm just going to make it as far as I can. Uh, and the first day wasn't too bad. I mean, the, the grade is about 10%, r relatively straightforward, took about uh, five hours to climb um, uh, a kilometer in altitude. Um, it's a, an eight kilometer walk. And uh, at the end of the first day, I was well, that was a little difficult, but not too bad. Um, and then the second day uh, was a slightly longer hike of about 12 kilometers. Uh, yeah, sure enough, like halfway in, I'm like, oh, man, this kind of sucks. But well, I'm not dead yet, so I might as well keep walking. Um, and I did. Uh, and at the end of the second day, I was like, OK, you know what? I, I actually feel pretty good. I think I can maybe pull this off. Now, day three um, is actually kind of an optional thing. Um, some people just continue straight up and uh, hike all the way to the top. Um, I chose to take an extra day. Um, at, uh, at this point, I'm at 3,700 meters um, uh, at the end of the second day. Uh, so I decided to stay there for an extra day, which gets me used to the altitude uh, before I head all the way up. And um, turned out, actually, that worked out pretty well in my favor. Um, you know, we did a little hike on that third day up to about 4,100 meters and then back down. And that was such a like sort of light little hike that I'm like, I got this. This is not going to be a problem. This is going to be easy. Um, uh, I probably shouldn't have psyched myself up um, quite as much as I did. So day four. Um, day four is where hell begins. Um, now, it, the initial hike up to um, this particular hut, it's called Kibo Hut, uh, is about a nine and a half kilometer uh, hike. 
Took me about uh, five hours. I got there around 1, 1.30 in the afternoon. And, uh, you know, you get there, they serve you some tea, some popcorn, and they're like, try to get some sleep. And I, it's the middle of the afternoon. I, like, I'm, I've got this schedule. I go to bed 10, 11 o'clock, fall asleep, wake up at 7 o'clock. Uh, but no, I like middle of the afternoon, try to get some rest. And I am in a room with 11 other Australians. Um, I say, like, so they were a little loud as um, they might have a reputation for being, uh, but great people. Um, and so didn't really nap that much and five o'clock rolls around. It's like, okay, time for dinner. We have some dinner. And uh, an hour and a half later, okay, again, try to get some sleep because we're gonna wake up at 11 o'clock that night. Uh, so I did manage to get four and a half hours sleep, woke up at 11 at night, and then at midnight, we start climbing. Now, the conditions uh, that we had been up to at uh, that point uh, were relatively straightforward. In fact, this very shirt was the one that I had worn um, up until that point. Uh, it was relatively warm, it wasn't raining, uh, it was sunny, uh, you know, it was just like it was a decent 15 degrees. I was pretty happy with this. Uh, midnight, uh, at that kind of altitude, um, things get really cold. Um, it was actually about minus 15, um, so no longer with this shirt do. Um, I had to wear multiple layers. Uh, so I had my snow pants on, I had my winter jacket on, my gloves, my hat. Uh, so dressed to the hilt like this. Um, as I begin uh, my trek in pitch darkness, um, I have a little headlamp so I can see a radius of light about this big. And we begin our hike uh, up the top. So now, up until that point, like I said, we had about a 10% grade, wasn't too bad. The grade now is about 60% um, as we climb up the uh, caldera uh, of, uh, of the mountain. And you go really slow. Um, there's sort of this saying that they have, pole pole, uh, which just means slowly. Uh, so we would take a step, take a step, for six hours in pitch darkness. Um, as we try to make our way through the top, uh, every now and then I would see somebody struggling. Uh, one guy uh, apparently passed out twice and he decided to just head back. Uh, another one had extreme headaches, uh, so she went back down. Um, and I am struggling. I am freezing cold despite how well I thought I was dressed. Um, I was absolutely freezing. So I'm like trying to make sure I do not want to get frostbite. I would like to keep all my fingers. Thank you very much. Um, exhaustion from having, uh, you know, trying to climb this thing. And about an hour and a half in to this hike, I was like, you know what, I'm done. Like, it was a good walk. Uh, it's been fun, uh, but I think I'm okay just heading back down. Um, but I thought to myself, you know what, maybe another half an hour to go. Uh, and I will have made it a third of the way up. I kind of like round numbers. I like things that I can, like, uh, man, an hour and a half out of six, what is that? I can't reduce that fraction. Uh, one third works for me. So I was like a half an hour in, I can do that. Uh, and sure enough, I, I managed to uh, walk that half an hour. Of course, obviously, I've got a picture at the peak, so I probably already gave away the ending, but uh, bear with me. And uh, yeah, after two hours, well then again, like, like I said, I like my round numbers. I was like, if I just make it another hour, I will be halfway. Um, let me just make it halfway. And I, I spent that hour hiking uh, in the freezing cold. Um, you know, there's, there's no light up except for the headlamps. If I looked up, I could see all the headlamps um, on the way up. I could look behind me. I could see the headlamps all the way down. Um, there was no moon out that night. Um, uh, the, uh, the wind, um, the rain was starting to come in, and uh, you can see the ice building up on the rocks around us. Definitely not a very pleasant uh, climb up. Uh, towards the end, uh, after about doing this for five hours, I just kept saying, I just want to see sun. I want to see the, the light coming off the horizon, show me something. And sure enough, around 5.30, there was this like red gleam of light off in the distance. Um, I was so excited um, just to see light again. I am, was not a happy camper um, going all the way up here. And finally, like towards the end, I'm now at this point climbing up these rocks, trying to get to 
And the funny thing is, is after like six hours of hiking, I'm not even at the peak yet. All I get to is what's called Gilman's Point. It's the edge of uh, the crater. Uh, but sure enough, at six o'clock um, in the morning, I reach the edge of the crater, Gilman's Point, and the sun is coming up. It is absolutely glorious. Um, I actually brought my camera, which was probably stupid, like DSLR, big, huge thing that I had on me. Uh, everybody thought I was crazy because it was like a kilo worth of camera gear. Um, like I said, I am not a smart man. Um, but sure enough, I made it to Gilman's point. Um, I actually uh, pretty much broke down crying at that point just from the sheer exhaustion um, that I um, had from that point, the sheer beauty of what I was seeing, the pictures did none of it justice. And then I had another two hours of hiking to go. Um, turns out there's another two hour hike from there all the way up around the edge of the crater. Um, so uh, what's called uh, Kibo Hub is at 4,700 meters and Gilman's Point is at 5,700 meters. So I've now over six hours climbed uh, up uh, a kilometer, uh, which is about like, I think four and a half kilometers worth of hiking um, just to get up to that point. And then another two hours of hiking, which he said it was just a lot easier. It's, it's not the same grade, you just go around. But when you're so utterly exhausted, um, you, you kind of, uh, you, you, you plow through and I just wanted to get up to the top. There was one point um, I passed uh, somebody else who uh, was so exhausted he couldn't even open his eyes. Um, he, uh, his guide was holding him up and I'm just like, why is he still trying to make it to the peak? He is so far gone, he should probably be going down at this point. Um, and I'm just kind of thankful I wasn't in that kind of condition. So sure enough, I make it up to the peak. Glorious, I made it. Um, thank you very much. Thank you. First thing is, is there's always something on the other side, which is getting down. Um, and uh, again, like just being so exhausted, my legs couldn't really handle um, trying to make it back down. Uh, I was okay for a little while, but um, so along the edge of the crater, uh, isn't too bad, but then trying to go down the side, it's actually this very loose gravel. So when you take a step, it moves, and you require a lot of leg strength to hold yourself up. And so I kept falling down, I kept falling down. Uh, at one point, um, literally with, with my guy, just like my aunt, arms around his shoulders, us together, trying to go down this hill as fast as we can. It took me three and a half hours to get all the way back down to Kibo Hut. Um, at 4,700 meters. The problem is, is the way their logistics work on the mountain is you don't stop there. I now have to make the nine and a half kilometer walk from there all the way back down to 3,700 meters. All this after having four and a half hours sleep, having spent eight hours hiking up, three and a half hours hiking down uh, with that exhaustion. Thankfully, I, I keep a we had about an hour to just kind of like relax, regroup, have some food. Uh, and it, uh, it, that wasn't good. Like, if you might imagine, for any of you who've done such extreme amounts of exercise, the moment you stop moving, your legs decide to just like kind of seize up and not work anymore. Uh, in fact, two of the other Australians had to get wheeled down. They got put on these big gurneys, strapped in, uh, and then there's like a big bike tire underneath that a bunch of people will push down uh, to get them down to uh, Harambo Hut, the, the hut up. 50, um, 3,700 meters. Uh, I took some Advil. Um, I limped my way um, in the beginning, and thankfully, about a half an hour in, I was able to walk relatively well um, all the way down to uh, to Harambo Hut. Could get a good night's sleep. Probably one of the better nights of sleep I had gotten that week, um, and that wasn't saying much. The last day. Um, I now have to hike 20 kilometers all the way back down to the final uh, gate. Uh, and I did that as fast as I can. The guy, the guy was saying, I was like, yeah, maybe six, seven hours to get down. I'm like, hell no. I, uh, I, I got down in four and a half hours going down as fast as I could. Uh, I rolled my ankle like four times. Uh, again, when I get tired, um, I start stumbling, I start making mistakes. And, uh, but you know, I made it all the way up to the top, I made it all the way to the bottom, um, and I was really happy with myself, um, although the first thing I thought to myself, I actually had a little journal, um, since there, you know, surprise, surprise, there is no internet access 
um, on the mountain. Uh, I was a little disappointed. I thought I paid for Wi-Fi. Um, but uh, yeah, I had a little journal. And the first thing I had written in my journal after I had come down off the peak was, uh, Jesus fucking Christ, that was the stupidest thing I ever did. Um, beforehand, I had these dreams of, you know what, after Kilimanjaro, I'll do like Aconcagua in South America. Now, I am really happy with my couch at home. It is the best. Okay, so with that story uh, aside, let's talk about what is uh, success. Because I'm going to have a little theory. Um, uh, uh, my theory is, is that you are here because you want to be successful. Uh, you are passionate about the stuff that you do, um, and you are here to learn from you know, these great speakers um, that have been here for the last two days, or three days, for those of you who did the workshop, um, you know, to learn from their experience and their expertise um, so that you can go back to uh, the work that you're doing, whether or not you're working in an agency or freelance, working for a big corporation, uh, you too want to be successful. Now the question is, is uh, you know, how do you define success? I mean, how many of you, uh, you know, after, let's say, you've been working for a number of years, you put some money in the bank, and you now have, let's say, like, uh, two million euros in the bank. How many of you would say you were successful? I don't know, a few hands, well, are you tired or not? Okay, let's get some of my hands, like, put them all the way up, just so I can really see them. There we go, okay, so there's a few of you. Uh, you know, as a... Uh, society, a lot of us kind of look at money as a marker for success. Um, I have been very lucky um, in that I have been successful. Uh, yes, these are my two cars. Um, yes, my custom license plates are Snookums and Snookers. Um, uh, I uh, thankfully have not bought any more cars. I've held myself to two, considering there is only one of me. There's only so many cars I can drive at one time. Uh, but, you know, I decided to ask uh, a few folks um, what their definition of success is. Uh, and Mina was nice enough. Um, one of the things that she had said is, is that she doesn't like measuring uh, herself against external markers, um, whereas obviously I kind of do. Uh, but uh, it, it is really easy for those goalposts to move, right? Like, you know, we might define success as this, and then if I say, nope, success is actually this, or it's this other thing, I mean, heck, in our industry, right? I'm a PHP developer. Ah, oh, you're, you're an idiot for being a PHP developer. You're not going to be successful with that. You need to be a Rails developer. No, you need to be a Python deliver, uh, um, developer. We often sort of define success within our industry uh, by the tools um, that we use. Um, run uh, Ashley Baxter, um, she has a, a startup doing uh, insurance. Um, back in the UK, and she says, success means crawling into bed at the end of the day feeling creative, creatively satisfied and challenged. Uh, and I think another one um, quote that, again, Mina had given uh, was, success is liking yourself, liking what you do, and liking how you do it, which I think is a fantastic way of putting it. Um, and I think it's one of those things that I've actually struggled with, um, having reached uh, a certain amount of financial success uh, because it, money ha is a great thing in a certain way, uh, but once it is removed as a motivation, uh, for me, it has been difficult to figure out where I want to put my energy. Um, so, well, let's go through some of this. Um, how to become uh, successful. So going back to the whole climbing the mountain thing, um, they actually, uh, at the base of Kilimanjaro, they've got this little uh, sort of uh, model of the uh, mountain, and they kind of show, you know, here are all the different steps, the different routes that you can take to achieve success on this mountain. And, you know, there's sort of these steps uh, that you take. Um, you know, the, here's a path, here's where you're going to be at any time, and sure enough, I was able to be successful um, following uh, those steps. Now, often people will say, you know, it's about who you know. Um, I don't think that's necessarily accurate, but I do think it's about who knows you. Um, if somebody doesn't know who you are, uh, the chances of you um, getting work is going to be a lot more difficult. So I think at the core of that, you know, how do you get people to know who you are? Um, to me, it's through being visible. 
And I recognize that this is tough. Um, and that, that can be tough for a number of reasons. One, uh, I do know that I've had the privilege of uh, being a white male. Um, I wish I, you know, I didn't choose that, but it worked out really great in my favor. Um, but, you know, if it's all about who you know and who knows you, often you're surrounded in this network of uh, people which, you know, who do I know? I know a lot of other white male developers, um, and therefore if I'm pulling in people that I know, I'm going to be pulling a lot of other developers in. And so one of the things that I've had to do um, in this sort of process uh, is try to uh, help those um, uh, outside of my sort of initial uh, visibility and figure out, okay, who, are, who else is doing great work um, to sort of break a little bit of that boys club um, that we've had in our industry for a long time. Now there's a ton of things that everybody can be doing. Um, blog posts, uh, I know blogs are kind of passe, but I think they are still fantastic resources. Uh, magazine articles, um, I've written for um, both online magazines and offline magazines. Uh, YouTube videos, record yourself doing some stuff. You can do some Twitch streaming. Uh, I, there's a ton of people uh, on uh, Twitter that I see posting uh, their live streams. I've done some before, uh, which is always humbling as I uh, stumble over some programming concept and like, wow, I suck. But uh, thankfully, you know, I get through it. Uh, CodePen is another great resource. Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, books. Uh, I've been very thankful to have written uh, three books, which you know isn't that much compared to some people. Uh, but books, books are kind of those weird things where it, having written a book, suddenly you become like an expert. Um, you know, like, oh, you've written a book. Well, you must be smart. And I'm like, Haha, fooled you. Um, public speaking. I think as we've seen, uh, you know, over the last couple of days. Uh, people willing to share their expertise and knowledge, um, and I, I think you know the more visibility you have going through these things, and uh, you know I look to other people in this industry and see like okay how did they become successful, uh, and I've seen people uh, Una Kravitz to me is uh, phenomenal just the amount of uh, work that she's done she's like 24 25 um, and has had a ton of successful work um, putting that stuff out there. Uh, and again, I keep going back to Mina Markham. Like she organizes uh, a conference in Dallas, although now that you've moved to San Francisco, probably not so much anymore. But uh, meetups, um, you know, have put out a ton of resources. All of this stuff um, gives people visibility. Now people know who she is. They invite her to conferences. She gets to do cool work, like working on the Hillary campaign and working at Slack. Like I think that by being visible, uh, you have opportunities. Um, you know, when a job comes up, I'm like, ah, oh, who should we hire? You know, do I want to look at a thousand resumes? Uh, and I've had to do that. It is painful. Um, or if you know somebody, it's like, oh, I know somebody. You know, this person might be a good fit for this company. Uh, that is going to be a lot easier. I'm going to reach out to that person uh, before I uh, hire anybody uh, or go through all those other resumes um, because it's. You know, we, we want the, the sort of the, that shortcut, um, at least from a hiring perspective. Um, and, you know, if we have that network, if we know these people are out there, um, it's going to be a lot easier to get hired. Uh, now, when it comes to sharing your stuff, I think that a lot of you might think that you need to be an expert, and I don't believe that's the case. Um, in fact, I have never considered myself uh, an expert. Um, all I do when I uh, do public speaking, when I do my workshops, is I share my experience. And so the moment you've worked on anything, even as a student, you now have experience. You can talk about that experience and share that with others. They can take that experience and go, you know what, that might be useful for me. Um, and then you continue to share that. Uh, of course, with a lot of this, I think uh, Josh Davis um, said something very important, which was, you know, the type of work you make is the work you'll get hired uh, to do. Uh, I often did a lot of side projects um, that, uh, were just fun for me just to figure out a technology. So the stuff that Josh was showing, uh, just to play with the technology, figure out what he could pull off with it, um, was something that I applied to uh, the stuff that I did as well. Uh, way back uh, when I would do like, oh, I want to figure out how to do OAuth. So I built a little application that did Twitter OAuth so I could figure out that workflow, figure out how that works. Um, I, built, uh, I, I built an app 
uh, for this sort of exercise program called 100 push-ups. As you can see, it clearly worked. And, uh, but at the time, it was like, oh, you know, it's a mobile app, so I can play around with local storage, I can play around with uh, some mobile technologies. Uh, you know, th these are my ways of learning. And once I have that skill set, I can apply that to uh, client projects. I can apply that to uh, my daily work projects. Now, again, with a lot of these things, there are caveats. Uh, you know, I talk about how you know, all of these people have become successful through being visible. Um, I think one of the caveats is survivorship bias. Like, I look at all these people who have done all this great work and have become successful, but at the same time, I am sure there is a bunch of people who have put in a ton of work uh, and still haven't gotten that visibility, haven't seen that success um, that maybe others are. Um, so, you know, with a lot of this, it, there is a caveat. Now, as well, as I mentioned, uh, you know, the, the, the whole uh, idea of privilege. Uh, I recognize that I come from a well-represented community. Not everybody else does. Um, I had actually seen a, an interesting uh, statistic um, where uh, uh, basically, uh, and my apologies that I'm, if I get any of these numbers wrong, um, that uh, uh, white people in particular, uh, 90 uh, they, out of 100 friends, like 99% of them will be white and they'll have one black friend uh, versus uh, black people where you know only 75% uh, of their uh, community is black and then they have like 20% white and then they have it. So like they have a more diverse um, uh, community than uh, the other way around. And I, I think that uh, you know it takes effort to diversify uh, your community. One of the things that I've done on uh, Twitter, for example, is try to follow uh, people uh, besides just other white males uh, to see what they're talking about, to figure out what they're working on, um, and have that visibility into those other communities. Because there's some people out there that are doing some fantastic work. So, you know, assuming you go through this whole process and you actually get to uh, a point where you are successful, um, you know, how do you help others uh, become successful? And I think this is an important step. Uh, you know, when I was climbing that mountain, I did not climb that mountain alone. This guy, Albert, uh, was my guide uh, that helped me uh, up that mountain. He also helped me down. Um, he basically uh, forged that path uh, in front of me. Uh, that Tim mentioned video that I had mentioned, uh, he talks about becoming a teacher. Um, and you know, even if you're not a teacher, be a teacher. Share your ideas. Um, you know, there are a number of ways that you can help those coming up. Uh, mentorship, um, open office hours, connecting people. Um, you know, anytime I see two people that have a need, uh, you know, this guy needs a job, this guy needs somebody to do work for him, I will connect them. Uh, you know, I've, I've done open office hours where um, I just open up my calendar, people can book a time, and we can talk about uh, what people are doing. Uh, you know, I can figure out what they're working on, I can help them. I mean, interestingly enough, most people um, that took me up on that offer didn't want to talk about CSS, um, they didn't want to talk about uh, web development per se, they wanted to talk about their careers. Everybody was at a sort of a different path and often were at a decision-making process, like, oh, I've been doing this thing for five years, should I change things up? Uh, and I think having that opportunity to you know, share my experience with them, but also have them share their experience with me um, is highly useful, um, and try to create opportunities for others. Uh, the other thing is, is that um, you never uh, become successful by yourself. I, the whole idea of like the self-made person, uh, to me, is a myth. Um, I did not climb that mountain by myself. There were 11 people that helped me climb that mountain. Uh, there was not only my guide, um, there was the, uh, the junior guide, there was a cook, junior cook, uh, the porters that brought all the food and water up that mountain. Uh, thankfully, I did not have to carry all that much stuff. Uh, you know, and, and these people um, helped me get up there. Likewise, you know, in my web development career, uh, the friends that I've had that have helped me get into jobs, um, the people that have allowed me to uh, write books for them, uh, the people that have um, 
asked me to speak at conferences. Um, you know, the, the kind of success I have is because of really all of you. Um, and um, I think it's, I, I am internally great, grateful for um, the success that I have. And I too also want to help people, um, others become successful um, at what they've done. So with all that said, what comes after becoming successful? Uh, like I said, we, I, I climbed that mountain. At some point, I had to get myself down. Um, and I think that a lot of people in this industry are kind of hitting this mid-career point and trying to figure out what comes next. Um, you know, we, a lot of people kind of hit that inflection point uh, where, uh, and this is where I feel like I've been for the last couple years. Um, both uh, Josh Davis and uh, Paula yesterday had kind of talked about hitting a point. Like, I mean, Josh stopped working for, or not, didn't say stopped working. He stopped having a web presence for four years, right? Like, I might have been reading into it, but it kind of sounded like he wanted to take a break and then come back in. Uh, Paula talked about just pushing through um, and continually doing good work, going back to being a beginner. Uh, I was reading this book called What's Next? Uh, find, follow your passion and find your dream job, which is all about people that are mid-career. People normally in their 40s, as I am, uh, trying to figure out what to do um, after uh, hitting that uh, point. And one of the things the book mentions is that the secret to uh, a successful second career begins with knowing who you are and where your talents will shine, which is a really difficult thing to do because for the last 20 years, I have been a web developer. I feel like my talent is in making websites. The problem is, is I don't really like doing it anymore. Um, and so what do you do when the thing that you used to enjoy doing, um, that, that enjoyment is gone, right? Like, do I want to spend the next 20 years uh, building a website with the, the framework du jour? Uh, so I am still going through uh, this process. I am still trying to figure out what I want to do next. Um, but for those of you who might be into this uh, same uh, situation, you know, trying to figure out maybe there's something new within this space. Like I saw, um, I want to. Hopefully, again, I don't get this wrong. Rachel Smith was talking about how, you know, she was get a, getting tired of the stuff she was working on and decided to play around with uh, SVG um, and started doing a whole bunch of uh, stuff there and got excited again. Um, so I think that often, you know, we can still sort of stay within the same industry, play with a different facet, have fun with the technology, um, and get re-excited about uh, the work that we're doing. Um, the other thing is, is, you know, if you are looking at kind of going into a new part of this field, uh, seek and listen to advice from people who have been successful in this field. Um, I did front-end development for a long time, and then I switched to do product management for a while. And I did a ton of research, I talked to people, um, I talked to other uh, product managers to find out how were they successful um, so that I could um, uh, repeat that. Paul, of course, mentioned being a neophyte. Um, you know, being a beginner again um, can be exciting. Uh, the problem is, is uh, well, okay, one, it's easy to be a neophyte um, in our industry because it changes so often. Right? There's always a new technology to learn, something new to play with. Uh, in that way, being a beginner is easy. However, when you've been an expert for so long, being a beginner can be difficult. Um, I started playing around with this new technology. I actually did a little YouTube video. I put it out there. And I got people like, ah, you're doing it wrong. I'm like, well, that's not what I want. Like, I, I want to be excited about this. And if you're coming at me telling me about how such a crappy job I'm doing, it's like, well, yeah, I'm doing a crappy job because I'm being a beginner again. I'm trying to learn this stuff uh, again. And uh, that actually kind of took a little of the excitement out of it. Um, it, it took out that, that fun. Um, Similarly, um, I like video games, uh, but I play stuff where um, it's kind of my own little world. I like racing games. Um, I tried to play uh, um, this game. It was a first-person shooter. And I was like, oh, this is a lot of fun. Uh, but it had audio. Uh, I had my audio turned off, but I could hear the other people speaking. And again, I'm a beginner. Um, I was like in last place of all the people on this team, but one of the other guys on the team was like, yeah, that guy really sucks. And I'm like, damn it, that hurts. And I stopped playing because that wasn't fun. 
Um, so, you know, being a beginner can be difficult when you have other people putting you down. Uh, uh, our, you know, hopping on Twitter and Facebook these days can often be very difficult because there is a lot of negativity out there. Uh, I've tried to be as positive as I can, only sharing positive things, uh, but I know I fail at that. Um, I often, uh, I, I can be negative as well, so it can be very difficult. Uh, one of the uh, passions that uh, I have been getting into recently has actually been uh, making espresso and latte art. As you can see, I have a lot of work to do. <laughs> but the great thing is, is I do this at home, right? Like, nobody can criticize the stuff that I do, and I kind of like this process of learning again, uh, this idea of doing something uh, new. I say that almost looks phallic, but let's not go there. That also looks kind of in inappropriate. Uh, but sometimes I get something that actually kind of looks pretty decent, and I'm like, yes! I think, uh, you know, maybe I can be a barista and, and work at a coffee shop instead of doing web development. Uh, maybe. Uh, so, you know, the, the excitement of being a beginner uh, is a lot of fun. Uh, you know, it's, uh, Ashley would say, it, it's human nature to always strive for more. Um, so there will always be new mountains to climb. Um, so on that note, thank you very much.